social change and evolution is a much more piecemeal kind of gradual give and take process and the way we envision freedom is going to matter into how we talk about it and consequently how we pursue it and try to create it try to convince others of its value etc welcome to the non-servium podcast a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, as well as links to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud accounts, visit our website at nonservium.medium. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. We appreciate all donations, big or small, and your support helps us keep this project going. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 22nd episode of the show. My guests today began their political journey on the libertarian right. Their political philosophy is now more closely associated with what some might call left libertarianism. The libertarian left in America has many tendencies that separates itself or is sometimes even hostile to thinkers such as Ayn Rand or Murray Rothbard. However, my guest today challenges us to not throw out the baby with the bathwater and feels that it's entirely possible to reject and to criticize the reactionary shortcomings of some of these thinkers while also highlighting the contributions they made to a kind of libertarianism that may be worth taking inspiration from. In this interview, we discuss a variety of topics, ranging from immigration to egalitarianism to free market anti-capitalism and more. Here's my interview with Corey Massimino. Corey Massimino studies philosophy at the University of Central Florida. He is a fellow at the Center for a Stateless Society. His research focuses on virtue ethics, market process economics, and anarchist political theory. His writings have appeared in outlets such as The Guardian, The Independent, and Playboy. Corey Massimino, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. I would be here. Of course. Uh, how's it going? How's life in Florida? Uh, not too bad, I guess, given, uh, you know, all these background conditions that we're all trying to adjust ourselves to. But Florida's nice. I've lived along the East Coast a little bit, Virginia, New York. Um, and then I lived in Texas for years. But Florida is, is my favorite place that I've ever lived. Um, it's great weather and a lot of space, a lot of green as opposed to the cities that I've lived in. So, um, yeah, Florida's nice. I like it here. I'm glad to hear that, Corey. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go ahead and jump into the first set of questions I have here for you. Okay, so your politics lean more towards sort of the radical liberal side of the C4SS milieu. How do you and your political convictions differ, if at all, from that tendency? Um, I guess it depends on what exactly that encompasses. I, I agree broadly with the idea that it's fruitful to understand anarchism as having this continuity with uh, liberalism and, and the old liberals. Um, just like Benjamin Tucker said, unterrified Jeffersonianism. Not that I'm a big fan of reclaiming Jefferson of all people, but that gets at the meaning of radical liberalism, I think, as a form of anarchism. Um, and I don't know if my politics substantially differ from whatever people take that to mean. Um, you know, fairly straightforward individualist anarchism. You know, I don't really fall into the mutualist camp. Maybe some mutualists would, would have me, but it depends. It seems like you find some mutualists who emphasize dynamism and progress and, and sort of social evolution um, in a decentralized experimental manner. Uh, they value that above all else. And so that can take precedent over some sort of rigid or absolutist opposition to various economic phenomena, such as rent, interest, and profit. Or you'll find mutualists that do take that hard line against rent, interest, and profit. Um, and whether certain mutualists in history, like Perdon or Tucker or whoever like you have in mind, Wherever they fall on that divide probably differs uh, according to who you ask. But I don't have that sort of absolutist opposition to those things. But I, you know, I think I agree broadly with the with the anarchist view that a lot of rent, interest, and profit 
as it currently exists and has it, as it has existed historically is tainted at, at the least um, and morally questionable and, and probably exists to an extent that I suspect competitive markets would not permit. But uh, aside from that, I, I'm not sure if you have a more specific um, sort of intra-anarchist squabble in mind or disagreement that you want me to, to touch on. There's a couple of things you could get out there, I guess. Um, yeah, well, I mean, what, what comes to mind for you as far as maybe what separates you from someone like Jason Lee Bias, for instance? You just had me on to ask me, how do you disagree with Jason Lee Bias? <laughs> well, it's going to be a short podcast. If that's... <laughs> but yeah, Jason was a really big influence on me um, when I got into these ideas and started being exposed to C4CS and left market anarchism. Um, and I've you know, always found uh, Jason fairly convincing and, and a lot of his arguments and, and <laughs> the things we disagree about aren't that related to political theory or even uh, they're kind of philosophical. But I mean, when it comes to political theory, we're both very similar. We both kind of have this Rothbardian streak. I don't think he would object to, to me describing it that way. You know, and I think that the phrase left Rothbardian is like not really that useful. Um, Rothbard was like pretty complex and maybe we can get into Rothbard later because I wrote a book chapter on him yeah. and did another podcast on him. But pre- I guess preempting that a little bit, like he was a really complex dude, like even in his so-called left wing phase, it's not like I, he had the exact uh, lineup of views that would that I would agree with and that would align with me. Um, you know, so I don't really like the phrase left Rothbardian, but at least as opposed to a lot of other C4 assessors, I'm a lot more influenced um, by Rothbard's worldview and kind of, you know, he didn't use the phrase radical liberal, but but that definitely applies to his understanding of anarchism and how he situates it in the in the context of intellectual history. So I think I agree with Jason on most political theory things. We disagree on animals, non-person animals. I tend to think non-person animals have rights or something like rights, probably, and at the very least... I think we have some pretty extensive duties to non-person animals, whether they count as rights or not in your framework. And But Jason isn't really partial to those things. And clearly I'm virtue signaling here um, now that I have the opportunity to take the more higher ground over Jason. <laughs> but the other one is, well, I guess we haven't talked about it recently, but we used to argue about it a lot. It's a pretty interesting dispute because... Jason and I are both pretty Aristotelian in our philosophical leanings, and Jason takes uh, the Aristotelian emphasis on rationality as being the primary good for you know a flourishing human life. Um, he takes that value as entailing being straight edge as a, a kind of requirement of morality and avoiding psychological substances that affect and interfere with your rationality, such as alcohol or other drugs, um, he opposes those things, and he is very principled on it. I think I've seen him drink a beer or two, but he never, he did, he's never been drunk in his whole life. So, you know, it's okay to drink it for taste, but, you know, it's not it's not like you can ever have a sip of any anything um, as alcohol, but it's just about what, what level does it start interfering with your rationality, and if you think, you know, a flourishing life is going to be defined by by rationality and the exercise of your rational capacities and determining your course of actions, then it doesn't make sense on some level to then be suspect and very suspicious of psycho-altering substances. And so I disagree with him on that, though, because I don't think it's that straightforward that these substances necessarily interfere with rationality. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. Like, you know, a lot of people you know, for one, you have hard cases, and Jason perfectly admits this, and Jason likes coffee or whatever, but uh, but there are hard cases on the side. Well, it's like, what about coffee? What about prescription drugs, stuff like Adderall um, or antidepressants? Like, are these things, you know, why should we, you know, put the, the default state of your brain on a pedestal and then say that anything that interacts with that and alters it is counting as altering your rationality? It seems more like you know, various psycho-altering substances can improve your rationality, um, given the context and the, and the type and, and your and your own brain and your own dispositions. I think there's a sense in which some of these psycho-altering substances help people be more open and honest and, and lucid with others. And that's and, and it's hard for me to make sense of that just as saying, OK, well, it's just decreasing someone's rationality. But if it's helping them interact in an environment they would otherwise not be able to or to engage in social interactions and discourse that otherwise they would be they'd struggle to engage in because of whatever their default mental state 
then the psychoaltering substances could be said to be improving their rational capacities and um, helping engage them more. So anyway, I feel like this is a really random tangent that I've now gone on, but hopefully it's somewhat interesting <laughs> from a philosophical perspective to your viewers. I wanted to take your question about what I disagree with Jason seriously, so it's just that it's on the record. <laughs> That's probably the two main things. <laughs> All right, cool. In a Playboy article you wrote with Liz Wolf titled Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's pie-in-the-sky vision of the economy ignores so much, you write that, quote, the same fixed pie logic underlying Ocasio-Cortez's misunderstanding of the unemployment numbers motivates President Trump's populist crackdown on immigration and his rash, ill-conceived trade war. Explain what that fixed pie logic is and why you think it's a dangerous misconception. Sure. Uh, so that article is a couple years old, but I guess to just to just get at your general point about this fixed pie logic that I think tends to be exhibited by ideologies with populist leanings. Um, and I don't think populism is 100 percent irredeemable, but populism as it has existed and as it exists, I mean, is open to just a whole host of, of just toxic uh, and, and manipulable and um, demagogic traits that I mean, we don't need to get into, obviously, the, the consequence of this. But I, th I don't think it's just a right or left thing um, insofar as that's even a useful framework at all. So, you know, this level of populism, it, it is there with AOC and it is there with Trump. This way that they profess to speak for the people in some abstract sense um, or for the working class or for the people who've been wronged by, you know, the country or recent history or anything. And obviously this is not some like reductionist both sidesism like there are many differences between how populism manifests within AOC's ideology which is you know some kind of democratic socialism versus Trump's which is you know really kind of a white nationalism I don't I don't think it's really hyperbolic to say that it's his ideology if we can make sense of it at all and so far as he has one something like white nationalism so obviously populism looks really different in those in those ideologies but there is this commonality and I think one thing that leads people to end up kind of endorsing often is that fixed pie logic. And by fixed pie logic, I mean the idea that what matters more than the size of a pie is how many slices all the pie eaters get. So taking that to, you know, economic phenomenon, social phenomenon more broadly, the point is that interactions between social agents, given the right institutional environment, can yield mutually beneficial outcomes. They can be rooted in mutual exchange between two parties that benefit from the exchange because they value what they give up less than they're, what they're getting and vice versa. Um, and so in that sense, both the wealth of both parties uh, in the exchange have been increased. The pie has increased in size. They've not merely gotten another slice or anything, but the actual pie has increased. And this belief in the viability of mutual exchange, the possibility of it at all, and also the possibility of it being widespread and a defining feature of human society, that tendency, I think, is is fairly critical to liberalism as it has existed. And in, you can probably find something like that in a lot of the good liberals that we can learn from historically. And, um, you know, going back to, to Jason, I guess, Jason Bias, his article, uh, Radical Liberalism, the Soul of Libertarianism on C4SS, makes the case that this kind of belief in mutual exchange and this understanding of that so-called fixed pie logic and why it's so dangerous, that is is kind of the uniting feature of, of liberals in a lot of ways. And I think that's a huge, really critical component of my worldview and my political philosophy and my, and my moral philosophy. You know, it, it's not just anarchist or left libertarian in its significance, the, 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 that insight into the, the viability of mutual exchange, but it's also deeply connected to the Aristotelian philosophical outlook, which understands humans as having harmonious interests. Not that we never disagree or conflict in the real world, but that by resolving such conflicts and, and coming to agreements, we bring our interests closer into harmony um, and coordinate our plans with each other. And so I think in principle, there is a harmony of interests among all rational agents, because otherwise it's hard to make sense of something like universal justice. This is kind of related to the insight that it's better to be the subject of an injustice than to commit injustice. 
from old Socrates. But I guess my point is just that that insight into the viability of mutual exchange really goes, it runs deep in the worldview I find really compelling. Um, and so it's, it seems like a very important, and, you know, it comes, uh, we've gone as deep as, you know, these, these complex discussions about morality and justice. Um, but we started with, you know, a topical news issue with unemployment numbers. Um, so, you know, if anything that, that illustrates kind of how wide ranging, I think that Mm -hmm. that issue tends to be. Right. Right. And a lot of people use the same fixed pie logic, obviously, to rationalize their position against more liberal laws when it comes to immigration. And you were mentioned in a Wikipedia article called Immigration to the United States. Why were you included in that article? And what were you arguing in the link that was referenced? I believe that that article is the one I wrote for The Guardian a few years back when Bernie Sanders said something about how Open Borders was a Koch Brothers proposal. I'm sure we all remember that very well. And um, I wrote an article for The Guardian just kind of making, you know, basic straightforward arguments for the, the economic benefits and the moral benefits of open immigration, of open borders. And that Bernie's position was really wrong-headed and really inconsistent with his professed egalitarian outlook. And I think that Wikipedia article mentions his position on it and then links to, to that. And this is deeply related to the fixed pie issue. Sanders is another one like AOC, whose democratic socialism is tinged with that populism. And um, he commits some of the same mistakes. You know, ultimately, him and Trump share an underlying view on immigration that unites them. While Sanders supports more immigration and less brutal immigration enforcement policies, I mean, it's not a high bar, but he does. Um, nonetheless, they have this same underlying view of immigration, which is that, like, it's a resource drain. Like, that's the only thing that occurs when a new person comes into a country and they start consuming the resources of that country. And then so there's less resources in that country to go around for everyone else. And even if that were true which is not, it wouldn't really follow that we should just be against people coming into the country or limit that in some way, because that would imply this, I mean, this, you know, a, a nationalistic moral calculus that I think is really perverse and values people over others merely for being born on the right side of it, one in the dirt. But that notion and that view of immigrants and more broadly human beings as mere resource drains is quite destructive and even horrific i think it's it even ties into a lot of what we see with anti-natalist arguments the view that human life is a net negative and is not really a cool thing to impose on someone else and bring them into the world against their consent so-called and that ties into i think what is usefully termed eco-fascism um, and that's kind of a whole other debate i think but this whole this whole logic that humans are mere more, mere resource drains um, is just at the bottom of, I think, a lot of crap, you know, and it misunderstands that humans cr create resources. Humans are the ultimate resource, our mind, our innovation, our abilities to, to transform the, the world and nature given objects into usable, consumable objects and technologies that enrich our lives and enrich the lives of others. You know, so an immigrant comes in and they're not just consuming resources, they get a job and they contribute resources and they provide goods and services for others and earn an income through trade and spend that income on resources and everyone's better off. The pie is enlarged. A new person has come in. It's same when people are born, not right away because we're in that case, someone's a baby at first, but if anything, that's more of an argument against letting people have kids than letting immigrants in because the kids are resource drains for the first, you know, however many years and immigrants aren't. So it's all very backwards and, and misguided and frustrating to see professed egalitarians like Bernie and the supporters fall for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, hey, speaking of egalitarianism, it seems apparent that you and the progressive left both share a desire to move towards egalitarian ends. However, you radically part ways when it comes to means, right? What is egalitarianism to you? And why do you promote a strategy that, that parts ways with the progressive left? So I think egalitarianism is kind of a funny word. 
I would actually put it more strongly than merely disagreeing with the means, because in some sense there's a disagreement over ends, not in the sense that uh, we disagree over the value of egalitarianism, but disagree over exactly what egalitarianism means and exactly what that commits us to in the world. Because there are a number of ways to think about egalitarianism, and there are a number of respects in which humans can be equal or unequal. And um, this leads to people talking past each other a lot. You know, it feels like often those against egalitarianism say that because of our unequal natural faculties and, and physical abilities and talents and interests and personality, things like that, those things are inevitably unequal and differently distributed and it's fruitless to make them equal and probably counterproductive. But that's not really the kind of egalitarianism, you know, I find uh, <laughs> worth striving for or compelling. Uh, not a kind of egalitarianism that pretends that everyone is somehow, I don't know, equal in their capacities and abilities, but everyone is equal in their moral worth and more importantly, in their rights and their rights to freedom and autonomy. And that's the sense in which I might be said to disagree over ends with a lot of people on the left, because they tend to view egalitarianism more in material terms. And egalitarianism does have to do with material conditions. Wild inequality of resources will certainly give way to interpersonal domination, um, if not authoritarian governments and corporations. But mathematical equality of resources can't really be what egalitarianism is about because achieving a perfect mathematical equality of resources is also untenable and would, would require some sort of constant in itself authoritarian uh, meddling and um, interfering with people's voluntary activities that they that they undertake and projects they pursue in their daily lives so there has to be some flexibility there i do agree that rampant, wild, dangerous inequality in resources can exist and, and does. But I don't think that's the end all or even central thing of, of egalitarianism. Instead, it's that equal right to liberty and autonomy that I mentioned that we should understand egalitarianism and liberty as being mutually compatible, not opposed. I mean, this is this false dichotomy that if you're on the left, you support equality over liberty, apparently. And if you're on the right, you apparently support liberty over equality and practice that really doesn't even apply, but that's the idea, at least, that people have in their heads sometimes, and it doesn't really make any sense. Um, you know, liberty is a kind of equality. It's a kind of equal treatment between all persons. Everyone has the, the equal right to do as they wish, uh, you know, which insofar as it prevents others from doing the same. So it's this, it's this inherently compossible thing. Everyone is realizing their freedom at the same time and not impinging on the others. So that's this kind of egalitarianism, and I think that's the biggest biggest case in favor of of an egalitarian uh, kind of political goal is is, is going to be in that in that sense um, so in that sense you know people who are think they're opposed to egalitarianism are pro probably more egalitarian than they think and they're just letting the the symbols uh, kind of get in the way of thinking about these ideas I think in a better way mm -hmm. someone who arguably may fall into that trap is Rothbard because he was an outspoken opponent of egalitarianism and he uh he wrote a book uh on the subject titled egalitarianism as a revolt against human nature yeah uh, why is he wrong yeah well rothbard definitely is an opponent of egalitarianism it's worth noting that he wrote that book in 1974 so really not that long after what people consider his whole left-wing period and he held all those same views really in, in his left-wing period so it's just worth remembering that <laughs> While in some respects he was better during that time, not in every respect. Now there's there's some murky waters with the title of that book because you can get into questions about nature and human nature and Aristotelian ethics and transhumanism and that's like its own little weird debate I think. But to stick to the whole just just the egalitarian idea, Rothbard's objection is kind of what I mentioned earlier. You know, it doesn't boil down to much besides. Well, you know, people are irrevocably different um, in a million ways, and it includes talents and abilities and what we're capable of and what we achieve and accomplish and what we like and dislike. And, and there's no way to formalize and 
and and bring all these things into some sameness and it's not even we shouldn't want to either way that's that is a dystopian picture of sameness and conformity and grayness like the giver or something um, I mean that 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 can't be any egalitarianism we're striving for, and he's and that's his position. But I don't really think many people who support egalitarianism have that in mind. That's not really what what is mean is meant by it. You know, it's certainly egalitarianism gone wrong, or egalitarianism at its worst. This this impulse to conformism and sameness that crushes diversity. But egalitarianism at its best, Rothbard acknowledged that too. He did call liberty a kind of equality. Um, he didn't really emphasize it rhetorically, but he does write in his book, Economic Controversies, he uh, writes that liberty is the original kind of moral equality, the view that all people have the same equal right to freedom and liberty. And it is in that sense in which he supports egalitarianism and has an egalitarian view of politics and human nature. So I think he kind of you know, errs in a similar direction as a lot of people and underrates the fruitfulness in understanding liberty and freedom itself as a kind of important equality to, to which we should all strive. Yeah. And, and speaking of, right, you wrote about him in a forthcoming book that was published titled The Rutledge Handbook of Anarchy and Anarchist Thought. Your piece is called Two Cheers for Rothbardianism. What was that all about? The Rutledge Handbook is not published yet, but I think it is coming out next year. Um, hmm. It's really expensive because it's intellectual property is stupid. So, um, but if anyone is curious about how I, how I describe it in a minute here, if anyone is curious um, about it, feel free to email me, my name at gmail.com. You can put that in the show notes, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and ask for the chapter to see it. Um, I can let them, I just send them the document and happy to share with anyone. So, the idea behind Two Cheers for Rothbardianism is that Rothbard's legacy is really dominated by the last 5, 10, 15 maybe years of his life where he embraced paleoconservatism and integrated paleoconservatism into his existing framework of libertarian anarchism. And my point, at least one of my points in the chapter, is that it doesn't really make sense to think of Rothbardianism as just referring to paleoconservatism. Most people who call themselves Rothbardians nowadays are paleoconservatives, people affiliated with Mises Institute um, and, other, and other, other, other followers of Rothbard nowadays, and most of them, the great majority, fall under that paleoconservative label, and they embrace Rothbardianism, including his paleo turn at the end. Um, and so my point is just that, you know, this paleo stuff does not exhaust Rothbard's contributions. In fact, it really doesn't even doesn't even get started on his contributions. It's really kind of frustrating and an injustice that he is often only remembered for that. Um, although certainly he <laughs> bears the blame in those things. He has obviously bears full responsibility for adopting these paleo views and later in life. And, you know, this this includes, for anyone who doesn't know, like a whole host of stupid, ridiculous views. You know, he endorsed racialist science, uh, a la Charles Murray. He criticized the women's liberation movement and with sexist and misogynistic comments towards feminists. You know, he dismissed what he called victimologies, such as ableism and ageism and uh, heterosexism. And... I just want to try and look for value in the other things Rothbard did. I think his views on that stuff is are you know just dreadfully mistaken, dreadfully, and I think we should jettison them. And I argue for that in my chapter. And I guess my basic point is just that Rothbardianism is not paleoconservatism, at least not best understood that way. It should be understood as like the main frameworks that guided his research throughout his whole career. It started in the 50s, not the late 80s. You know, and what are those analytic frameworks and intellectual traditions and kind of conceptual lenses that, that guide his focus and that characterize his overall thought, not just the last few years of his life? And I argue in the chapter that there's basically four parts of that. There are four historically disparate traditions that Rothbard came along and liked and picked what he liked and didn't like and synthesized them into this harmonious kind of picture. First is that, 
he brings in his natural law theory. He gets that from Ayn Rand when he encounters her in the 50s. And um, he develops this Aristotelian Thomas natural law defense of liberty as a feature of human flourishing, a necessary feature of human flourishing, just like Rand, really. He doesn't cite her because they excommunicated Rothbard and he didn't like them anymore. But if you look at his stuff in Ethics of Liberty, it's very much objectivist and by implication, Aristotelian. Um, and he said in a letter once that Ayn Rand showed him the glory of natural rights. Uh, so obviously it was it was her that got him onto that. The second part of Rothbardianism, I argue, is this is anarchism, specifically his synthesis with the individualist anarchists, the original American libertarians, really, uh, Benjamin Tucker and Lysander Spooner um, and other writers of the magazine Liberty in the late 19th century who were the first to really come along and radicalize the liberalism of Locke and Smith and and others in a way that arrived at anarchism and, um, you know, completely had a radical opposition to the state. You know, and that view kind of went away and fell to the wayside individualist anarchism. The early 1900s, Liberty stops being published um, and most of them die off. And it's just not really a, a legacy that sticks around until arguably Rothbard revives it in the 50s and 60s. And his friends, the Circle Bastiat, as they call themselves, discovered Bastiat, which they named their group for through FEE, through Foundation for Economic Education. They were translating Bastiat then. And then through Bastiat, they found Molinari and 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 the people Bastiat influenced in France. And, and Molinari was really the first to, to describe a market-based anarchism, um, and that deeply influenced Rothbard and and his own work and his own theorizing about the viability of statelessness. So the second part of Rothbardianism is that individualist anarchism in the tradition of Spooner and Tucker. The third part of Rothbardianism is liberal class theory. This he gets from a number of places, um, really Franz Oppenheimer, an old right author, and Albert J. Nock. Um, he, he gets a lot of it from them, but he also incorporates the work of Gabriel Kolko and John Kenneth Galbraith, who were new left historians who weren't libertarians, but who wrote revisionist history about the progressive and new deal eras that Rothbard used for libertarian arguments, you know, in short being that the businessmen and wealthy and monopolists of those times used government regulation to advance their interests. And it was not a situation of an altruistic state stepping in to help the poor, but just a state stepping in to further enrich the robber barons at the expense of the poor. And Rothbard agrees with all that. And this liberal class theory, which really goes back again to those, a lot of the French theorists um, who predate Marx and who Marx really gets his class theory from and he has his own spin on it. But Rothbard just goes back and, and goes to them. And liberal class theory is the view where class stratification is a result of differential access to political power, uh, not necessarily uh, wealth itself or even the means of production, although that's I think that's plays an important role, but really it's it's access to political power and the state and the power of taxing and regulation and, and the monopoly and violence that the government gives you access to. So so Rothbard for his whole life uh, and, and even his paleo phase, uh, you know, this skepticism of, of big corporations and modern day capitalists who have built their wealth on, you know, land expropriated from peasants and developing countries or slavery in the 19th century. I mean, anything involving these uh, state-granted systems of violence, you know, any wealth built on that is, is going to be illegitimate in a deep way. So liberal class theory is the third. And the fourth and final one is Austrian economics, probably what he's most known for because he was an economist by trade and most and wrote, and wrote mostly about economics, um, although he was such a dilettante. Obviously, he wrote in all these other areas. But his Austrian economics, he gets from, you know, his teacher, Ludwig von Mises, uh, whom he he sees uh, at seminars in the 50s at New York University. And he's introduced to this whole world of ideas of, of praxeology and um, takes that and makes his own contributions there and kind of develops it in his own Aristotelian framework, uh, which, which Mises didn't share, and brings it in with his natural rights, which, again, Mises didn't like either. And all these things. So, so he brings all four of those traditions together: natural law, anarchism, uh, the individual's kind, liberal class theory, and Austrian economics, and brings brings them together as whole. And I think that is what we should call Rothbardianism. Those four things that really guided his focus throughout, and um, that's the basic idea behind the chapter. 
Um, and then I also try to argue that for, you know, the ways that other anarchists can, can learn from this and the ways that Rothbardianism can be improved. Because, as you said, the chapter is called Two Cheers for Rothbardianism, not Three Cheers. Rothbard needed some help from, from other anarchists and needed a more holistic opposition to, to domination. And I try to get into all that um, to, add to, his, to add to his stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, looking forward to, uh, to reading that. And, you know, speaking of other anarchists, right, a lot of folks don't consider anarcho-capitalism to be a legitimate form of anarchism. Uh, and Rothbard is looked at as one of the main founders of anarcho-capitalism. And what's even less known is that Rothbard seems to agree with the claim that it's not a legitimate form of anarchism because he is on record having said in reference to the subject that, quote, we are not anarchists, and that those who call us anarchists are not on firm etymological ground and are being completely unhistorical. What do you what do you make of that? I think it mostly comes down to Rothbard initially saw anarchism as a fairly lost set of ideas and a fairly lost movement ever since the collapse of the individualist anarchists and the libertarians that influenced Rothbard. Ever since they sort of died out, anarchism was much more dominated by less individualist, more collectivist and communist uh, elements. And over the years, by the time Rothbard comes along in the 50s and 60s, anarchism is really, really in an important way kind of defined by anti-market attitudes and uh, anti-individualist attitudes. Not entirely. Not entirely whatsoever, but to an extent, for sure. And Rothbard saw that, and I think he basically thought, well, you know, this isn't liberalism anymore. This isn't radical liberalism. This isn't the unterrified Jeffersonianism of Benjamin Tucker. You know, this stuff is is too indistinguishable from collectivism and authoritarianism, even if it's not a state in name, you know, whatever communal monopolistic enterprise that anarchists often propose replacing the current system is much too close to a state for Rothbard, and I think there's definitely a grand truth there. But when I mean, I think he's really making a sociological point then, and not necessarily a conceptual argument. Um, you know, at that point, he thought anarchism was an irredeemable term and phrase, and because it was associated with the liberals, and uh, that would never accurately include him um, and his his group. And I think he either. Because he, he didn't coin anarcho-capitalism. I believe that was Carl Hess. But obviously Rothbard was the first to like really, really popularize the term, I think. And he pretty much is considered the founder of anarcho-capitalism. And I think that he must have just changed his mind or came to think, okay, well, it is worth trying to redeem anarchism in this sense, you know, and with the capitalist hyphen, you know, it, to clarify that this is not the anarchism that has come to be known in much of the 20th century, but a kind of different breed, drawing in different intellectual sources in many cases. And so, I mean, you know, whoever you want to call an anarchist, I mean, I don't know. It probably, I don't think it really matters. I think Rothbard said a lot of interesting things, said a lot of stupid things. I think that there's useful stuff there for anarchists, whether you want to categorize him as one or not. It's interesting that you mention Carl Hess because he obviously sort of later rejected capitalism sort of moving away from Rothbard. They went in two different directions, sort of defining in some ways right libertarianism or the trajectory towards it and left libertarianism and the trajectory towards it. I know that you're a critic of, of capitalism also. What's wrong with it and what should be done with the right libertarians who promote it? To answer your, first, your second question first, what should be done with the right libertarians who promote capitalism? I guess they should be convinced to stop promoting capitalism. Uh, to answer your first question on what's wrong with capitalism, here's a list of things that are not wrong with capitalism, and then I'll tell you what's wrong with it. Here's what's not wrong with capitalism. Money, property, trade, division of labor, specialization, commodity production, getting people out of poverty. All those things are sometimes mistaken for being what's wrong with capitalism, but none of them are. I think what's wrong with capitalism is capitalist hierarchy. The hierarchy between a capitalist who has access to the means of production and a worker who does not have access to the means of production and therefore has no choice but to sell their labor in a buyer's market to a capitalist. And 
I think that this system of wage labor is antithetical to anarchist values and really common sense values about the the centrality of of self-direction and self-authorship and autonomy for flourishing life and the element of capitalism as a historical system that is truly at odds with self-direction self-authorship is i think is is very specifically that hierarchy and getting rid of that hierarchy which i don't think is any sort of natural or organic or spontaneous sort of outcome, which Rothbard and other capitalists often take it to be. It's more of an imposed thing. Um, differential access to the means of production, I think, is kind of rooted in differential access to political power, going back to the liberal class theory. So I think getting rid of the state, getting rid of political power would consequently pretty much get rid of capitalism, get rid of economic power, if that's how you want to look at it. And, uh, there would be no wage system where people had no option but to spend eight hours a day, you know, almost a third of their life taking orders, behaving like a robot, acting like a child in school, interacting with a teacher, or even worse, a inmate interacting with a warden. I think I think right libertarians really underrate how much people don't like their bosses. And for a lot of people, their bosses constrain their autonomy a lot more than their government. Not all the time, obviously. I mean the people in jail, they're definitely being constrained more by the government. The people getting killed overseas, definitely government. But lots of people who live in poverty and live paycheck to paycheck, even in more advanced societies, like supposedly the, like the United States, you know, even these people, um, you know, the average person, I really don't think they, they like answering to someone all day. And I think that people's imaginations are kind of limited because of institutional inflexibility and the normalization of this way of doing things. So same with, you know, relying on the state for everything, relying on capitalist hierarchy to get things done, I think is, is overrated, misguided. It's not that important to a functioning society and we could get, we could get rid of it. And so that would look like workers managing and running and owning their own shops or, or independent contractors and artisans and, uh, and, and craftspeople and working of their own accord, um, or a mix, you know, a hybrid, a kind of, you know, surely is to be expected, I think, um, of all sorts of various experimental modes of organization and economic production that could be tried out without so much burdensome regulations and licensing and restrictions by the state. And I think, I, I think capitalist hierarchy would, wouldn't have a long lifespan if there was a real competitive open market that gave people options. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's funny because right libertarians often just sort of claim the opposite, right? They say, well, in a actual, you know, free market, that hierarchical firms would win out and that there really wouldn't be any way to beat that. So they're not threatened by the left market anarchist position because they think that in the end, their ideas will win, that hierarchical business firms will win and possibly even dominate the marketplace. They might admit that they would be more numerous, maybe a little bit smaller than what we have now, but ultimately they think that it's, it's naive that we would have something approaching mutualism or something, insofar as like cooperatives would be the dominant norm or an individual working for themselves or whatever. I, I mean, you kind of explored this already and you can you know feel free to pass if you think you've touched on it enough, but do you have any more thoughts on why, why they'd be wrong in that claim? Yeah, yeah. So in my book chapter, I, I address specifically Rothbard's position on this stuff, obviously. And so, you know, I think his idea is getting called anarcho-capitalism is really misleading. I mean, in a lot of ways, capitalists and anti-capitalists are really talking past each other. They kind of mean different things by capitalism. They have different things in mind, different visions, different preconceptions and assumptions built into their, their terminology. And, you know, intellectual traditions that use terms differently. So it's frustrating to mediate these discussions. But, you know, Rothbard's view is kind of, well, capitalist hierarchy is just this kind of natural outgrowth of free trade and property um, and freedom. People have different time preferences, you know, that, and that, that is people have different tendencies to save and consume at different rates. Um, and so some people save up and get capital and then employ that capital and then rent that capital out to others whom they hire and pay wages in advance of selling the products. And then they get the profits. Now, they're, like on, a on the level of theory, this is fine. I mean, 
okay, if, if that's what you want to say, then okay, then, then that sounds like a mutually beneficial exchange to me. But I, I don't think that um, it really gets at why we've seen capitalist hierarchy emerge in, in the world and in history. We haven't had total free trade. We haven't had, I think, close to free trade. And I think that trying to attribute capitalist hierarchy to this kind of theoretical or hypothetical is, is not, I don't find it very compelling. And I, and I certainly don't find it much reason to discount the inherent moral value that I place on the autonomy of individuals and their ability to direct their own affairs and lives, which is relevant, even if capitalist hierarchy was more efficient and more, you know, abundance yielding than the alternatives. Well, you still have the value of autonomy that people don't have, you know, I mean, even if it was true that Mussolini made the trains run on time, it doesn't matter because that's not the only that's not the only value. You know, essentially, autonomy on some level can be treated as a consumption good. And, you know, efficiency isn't this totally value free like term just like floating out there, like totally separate and detached from like normative terms like like efficiency depends on like the subjective expectations and valuations of all the participants in the institutions that we're talking about, you know, so if those participants place an inherent value on governing your own affairs and being your own boss, well, that's going to end up giving monetary value to those things. I think it's all kind of interrelated, interwoven, the economic and moral issues here of capitalist hierarchy. So I'm not really convinced of the theoretical defense of capitalist hierarchy um, that Rothbard puts forward. Um, you know, I just think it really discounts the extent to which, you know, we've had just not free markets and instead we've had colonialism and slavery and mercantilism and corporatism um, and imperialism. Uh, it's just hard to hard to hard to think that this outgrowth is just some natural phenomenon and that if people's institutional imaginations were opened a little bit to think they wouldn't want to try something else, I, I don't buy that. But on some level, what you say about how these ideas are no threat to right libertarians because, well, you know, it's just about whatever is going to win out in freedom, right? Whatever freedom leads to, then okay, then we're all we're all fine with freedom, even though we have second order preferences about what people do with that freedom. We're all fine with freedom, and freedom will lead to whatever it is. I mean, that's true. In that sense, no anarchist should ever really have a conflict with any other anarchist. Um, but we know that's not true. Uh, so it's a little more murky than, than just that nominal support of, well, whatever, whatever freedom would result in, well, okay. But like our conceptions of freedom are kind of constrained in some ways, or at least tend to track what we imagine people do with their freedom. Um, and the way that freedom is kind of instantiated in, in, in the world and in society, you know? So in some sense, all anarchists are just on the same page because we just all want to get the freedom and then whatever happens after that, well, okay, it's freedom. But on a different, in a different sense, you know, that's not how it's going to work. Like if it does, you know, it's not like you just, okay, well now, now society is free. Like last night it wasn't, but today it is. And so now we're going to start the process of freedom and whatever naturally emerges, emerges, you know, social change and evolution is a much more piecemeal kind of gradual give and take process. And the way we envision freedom is going to matter into how we talk about it and consequently how we pursue it and try to create it, try to convince others of its value, et cetera. So I think it's kind of complex. Right, right. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting the point that Kevin Carson sometimes makes or or points out the way in which, and this is, I think it's true, I don't think it's a straw man of some ANCAPs, when they conflate markets and capitalism, they use this hypothetical capitalist market that they're promoting to rationalize or justify the injustices that exist under the current system. <laughs> you know? So yeah. it really is like a powerful rhetorical move to disassociate markets and capitalism just to be clear as to what it is that we're talking about and to not sort of do the crude thing of just sort of hand-waving or, or not acknowledging the the robbery and plunder or different types of injustices that have historically gone into creating this system or actually exist right now uh definitely i think that carson's idea of vulgar libertarianism which i think is the term for what you mentioned that he gives it very useful kind of framework um i don't think vulgar, i think vulgar libertarianism 
is maybe not the best term. It kind of implies a conscious element, which I don't think is necessarily there. For about six months, um, I call myself an anarcho-capitalist. You know, I mean, I found we've just been discussing now my objections to capitalism. Um, but I only I only came to form those at some point. I didn't have those automatically, and I used to have more traditional libertarian right wing views of capitalism. But I, I wasn't ill meaning. I didn't want poor people to starve. I mean, obviously there are people who have insufficient concern for the least well off. Um, but that's really different than just saying, well, anyone who supports capitalism, whatever that means, you know, is committed to some horrible moral outlook or something. I think that everyone who supports a certain ideology or certain social or economic system wants to think that the gains and successes that we have made in the world and the progress that we have achieved can be in some way attributed ultimately to whatever or however much their system has been realized, to whatever extent their ideal picture of society has been actually realized. That's what's led to progress. However, we've fucked up and receded and gone back and made things worse. Those categories are, well, those things are because of the insufficientness of our ideals being realized and how if they were realized fully, those bad things wouldn't have happened. This, you know, it happens with trying to attribute lower poverty rates to capitalism, but then dismissing, I don't know, other kinds of concerns about, about you know, treatment of workers or ecological concerns or anything you might, you might want. It also happens on the left with, you know, look at the literacy rates and the access to health care and gender equality, supposedly, of certain communist regimes, Cuba, uh, etc. Communists like to say that those gains are kind of an inherent thing to the communism they support and that the bad stuff that happened and currently happens, like forced labor and starvation and concentration camps and executions, wants to say those things are sort of these incidental features, this, these coincidental, you know, accidents that we don't want to replicate, that we're not going to because they're not, they're at odds, obviously, with the ideals of communism. I mean, that's what a, a, any well-meaning communist would think and any well-meaning capitalist would think that the terrible things that have happened under capitalism are at odds with capitalism. And they think the reverse of the other one. Um, so it's just maximum charitability for your own side and minimum charitability for the other. I think really it's just, you know, Capitals and communists, most people are pretty well-meaning in the abstract when it comes to this stuff. I don't think really, like, maliciously evil people do that much, like, build ideological systems and, like, like figure out all this weird, nuanced stuff. Like, they probably just, I don't know, uh, maybe some of them, but I feel like most people that, you know, we're talking to and that we're engaged in, I don't know, you call it political life with, you know, in a broad sense, political life, not just electoral systems or anything like that. But, you know, discourse involved in changing the world and contesting our ideals in a kind of a public sphere. You know, so I think that most people involved in that are pretty well-meaning and that vulgar libertarianism, or if you want vulgar communism, I'm not sure if that's if anyone's ever used that term before. Uh, but the mirror, the mirror phenomenon, you know, it's all pretty commonplace. And I think it just needs to be appreciated with nuance. Probably not all the good things in the world are a result of my own ideals being realized, and probably not all the bad things are completely impossible uh, or completely at odds with my ideals being realized. Um, it's probably a lot more of a mixed bag, even though obviously they are my ideals, so I think there's going to be more good associated with them than bad, otherwise they wouldn't be my ideals. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Vulgar communism. Uh, a listener of the show wrote an article for C4SS, I think it was titled that, vulgar communism oh, or something like that really okay I, yeah i feel stupid now for not even <laughs> knowing that article on super Resist. but yeah we're, we're checking out that one so shout out to that yeah. uh and then yeah it's funny uh yeah speaking of the, the left you often hear them use the same exact language you know free market capitalism is like <laughs> they're framing right it's like is this a right libertarian speaking or a communist or you know someone from the authoritarian left so, yeah, that's interesting that they both kind of do that. But Yeah, yeah, absolutely. M moving forward a little bit, I think we've touched quite a bit on that. I guess speaking of markets, not capitalism, though, you're part of one of the biggest voices in the individualist anarchist world. That's uh, C4SS. And, in fact, you organize the mutual exchange discussions that eventually turned into books. The exchanges are basically 
thoughtful and nuanced written conversations on certain topics within anarchist thought. What's your favorite mutual exchange that you played a hand in organizing? Oh, that's a tough question. I'm not sure about that one. Um, I've organized, yeah, I've organized some of them, or I guess most of them recently. The, the very recent one we've been doing, um, if you've been following along on c 4 sss site, our mutual exchange on economic uh, coordination. Mm -hmm. I did not organize that. I've had nothing to do with that. Um, that was a c 4 sss fellow named Emmy. They deserve all the credit for that. And they have some contributions to the exchange itself. Um, but the prior exchanges I've uh, worked on for sure. Um, we've turned three of them into books. The first one is on a similar issue to this, on free, uh, as we've been talking about, which is free markets and capitalism. That was a bit of a smaller one that involved Kevin Carson representing the kind of mutualist position. Uh, Steve Horowitz representing more or less capitalist position, but Steve is really one of the more nuanced capitalists, even if you, if you want to call him that. I mean, he is pretty open to the reasons why that term is, um, you know, has its uh, limits um, in, in what it describes. But nonetheless, he's, he's very skeptical of the way Carson pictures free markets looking. And so he argues against that. And then the, the, that mutual exchange, a third participant, which was Derek Green. I, uh, Derek Green? Derek Wall? Oh, I'm sad I can't remember his name now. But he's quite the interesting writer in the kind of socialist, green socialist space, um, very heavily influenced by Ostrom. So that was a great little exchange because all three of the writers were heavily influenced by Eleanor Ostrom, a uh, winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics that if your viewers haven't heard of, they should check out. Interesting work on commons governance and, and the like that has deeply influenced Kevin Carson, you know, if you like him and mm -hmm. her work will be relevant to you. So I, I have a, a special place in my heart for the very first one, because um, that was really fun to organize. But I've also really liked the ones that we've done later, which involve um, a wider cast of, of individuals and perspectives. The other one we did was Fighting Fascism, and um, that one is particularly timely, I guess, sadly. But that's a good one because it really chronicles a lot of the intra-C4SS, intra-anarchist disagreements about tactics to resist fascism, to fight fascism, different perspectives on, on the value and nature of free speech and political violence and the relationship between the two. And uh, that's probably perhaps the most important one, given the time we're in, sadly. The other one, which we just recently, a couple months ago, published as a new book, is uh, called Anarchy and Democracy. And, you know, I mean, that, that might be my favorite one. There are a number of essays in there that I just love. That mutual exchange is kind of about the intra-anarchist disagreement over to what extent we should support democracy and to what extent we should see democracy in alignment with anarchism, if at all. Um, some people tend to view them almost anonymously. Others view them as very much separate and you know, gulfs apart. Um, so a lot of perspectives in that debate and a lot of very interesting, um, useful angles on that, um, on that topic. And so that one might be my most favorite just because it's it's very abstract and kind of philosophical and really gets into the weeds of kind of, you know, what what is anarchy supposed to mean? Like in a substantial, you know, in terms of, you know, really in a real world like sense, like what are we envisioning? Are we just envisioning like mass democracy and like one person, one vote for everything? Or or are we envisioning a world where, you know, I like the way Grayson, one of the contributors of that one, puts it in his article which comes out against democracy. And his point is that, you know, anarchy is more like a vision of a society where everyone is their own king or monarch and have a total rule over their life, not infinitesimal rule over everyone else's life. That's not a sensible realization of anarchist values. Anyway, I, I guess I would say that one, anarchy and democracy, but they've all been really fun and I definitely recommend people check them out. I mean, if you don't, you know, if you don't want to buy them or if you don't have the money, that's fine. All their stuff's online for free. Um, if you Mm -hmm. Just Google Mutual Exchange C4SS, or if you go to my articles on C4SS, you'll see all of the introductions to the symposiums, which link to all the articles in, this, in the symposiums. Um, so they're really easily accessible if you just want to read certain articles in there or what. And if you want to go to our store, you can also just buy the books if you want to support us. Um, and if, if you want a physical copy of this stuff, you know, a lot of people prefer hardcover books. Or not hardcover, but uh, actual books as opposed to reading on the computer. You can you can go to our store website and, and get them there too. But 
I think we're 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 going to be releasing one soon, a book version of our mutual exchange on agorism, you know, on on uh, building the new world in the shell of the old and creating alternative institutions, you know, through dual power and black markets and, and things like that. So that's that's probably a huge interest to your readers and and uh, to your uh, listeners. And um, so, but uh, you can read that one online again. It's already online, but we're going to make it into a book if you if you want to support us in that way. Great, great. Looking forward to seeing that happen. I think the only article I, I published at C4SS was a part of that series as like some preliminary readings. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I I also mostly run the C4SS social media, and I recently posted your article on our social media. Oh, cool. I had, I had rediscovered it, and I was like, oh, you know, I'd forgotten about this piece. I really <laughs> like that piece of yours, actually. It's called, what is it called? Uh, autonomy and... Um, an action action that's right. yeah 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 and and I, I quite liked it quite a nice little theoretical overview of, of that stuff and of the point of direct action thanks. Um, so it's funny you mentioned that but yeah good stuff thanks cool where should folks go to check that out and is there anything else that you'd like to plug about c4ss uh, if you're curious about the mutual exchanges, you can look them up on our on our website and just read them. But also, we have on our store not just the mutual exchange books, but like things like laptop stickers and pins and zines and lots of other books and even T-shirts with cool anarchist quotes. So not just the books that C4S sells, uh, C4S sells, but you can support us by, with some of the other stuff if you're curious and looking at that. I just want to mention that, I guess. Good, good, good. All right. So... It's, it's going to be hard to have a conversation at this time without dabbling a little bit and some electoral questions. That's um, not a huge emphasis that we have on the, the show, and I know it's not something that you are particularly passionate about, <laughs> but I think we'd be missing an opportunity to discuss some of it right now, especially right before the election. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, let me ask you a theoretical question about uh, electoral politics then. If, uh, if the Democrats hadn't sabotaged Bernie Sanders, it seems he would have stood a stronger chance against Trump in the election. And in another universe, if he were elected, do you think he'd be a pacifying force for the left and radical politics in general? For instance, it seems that Trump has only added to the feeling of disenfranchisement and alienation in this country and is in some ways at least partially to blame for the ferociousness of the insurgencies taking place. And it seems reasonable to conclude that Bernie would have, oddly enough, in some ways, been more of a conservative candidate. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, it's kind of an interesting little issue. Um, there's certainly a sense in which, from an accelerationist perspective, um, you know, Trump is bringing everything crumbling down uh, <laughs> at a certain pace and getting Bernie Sanders in there would, I, I definitely do think that there's truth to what you're saying in terms of him being a pacifying uh, kind of force on uh, radicalism and leftism in American politics. I think maybe there would be an initial kind of boom, you know, like a surge of success and victory. And, but, you know, once that subsided, then it seems like it would just be similar to Obama, who didn't run on as radical as a platform as Bernie, but definitely emphasized this feeling of hopefulness and change and progress that uh, he promised to people and then certainly did not deliver on that. He really just governed the way his predecessor did for the most part. And he probably can be said to have had a pacifying effect as well. You know, I know, I know a number of people who they really like Bernie and really alienated by the Democratic Party's treatment of him, and this has only further disenchanted them with electoralism as a means of social change. It's very similar to Ron Paul in, 20, in 2008 and 2012 with libertarians putting all their eggs in that basket and seeing the Republicans, you know, not treat him well. And then, you know, becoming disillusioned and like, okay, well... Maybe that was useful for spreading the ideas on a big stage, but that was, it doesn't seem like we're going to get there. It's not really a viable path for change, uh, at least not radical change. And I think that's kind of happening now with a lot of socialists and a lot of leftists who saw so much hope in Bernie and are kind of seeing that, like, it doesn't really matter if there's hope in, like, a candidate. Like, 
because there's the system and like the candidate's going to be part of the system, whether you like it or not, whatever you do, whatever they do. So if you, have, if you don't have any hope in the system, then it doesn't make sense to have any hope in a candidate who will maybe now control parts of that system. It doesn't really make sense to me. So I think that is probably a good thing, I guess. I mean, I don't think electoralism is really a winning strategy. I don't know if I have anything particularly novel to say about that. I'm sure you've talked about that a lot on, the, on, on your podcast. I certainly think that just pursuing goals directly is better than trying to use the state as a mediator to achieve them. I mean, I hope Biden wins. I would prefer Biden to Trump, um, even though Biden's horrible, too, obviously. But I don't think I would want Trump to stay in office because it would, like, accelerate people to become radical more or something. That doesn't seem to me like a winning strategy either. Like, that's fairly, I think, I think you're lost at that point, like, if that's kind of what you're hoping for. I'm not sure if there's, mm-hmm. that's, that's actually a long-term thing either. So, um, I mean, there are not many great options on the table, no matter what, given the situation we're in. But, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, just trucking along, talking about the ideas, engaging in communal projects and activities and things like mutual aid where you can. And if you can, that's going to be where it's at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the beginning of the Trump campaign, you know, there were the never Trumpers. There are so many conservatives who were so skeptical of Trump. And and now that we've come full circle after his, his first term, they couldn't be more enthusiastic about their support for him. How did that happen? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's, that's a good question. It's a, probably one they'll be talking about for a couple decades. I, who knows? I, I'm kind of shocked. I mean, if I wasn't already pessimistic enough for America's political system and political institutions, seeing how basically every Republican just fell in line and just started going along with it all and then actively endorsing and cheering it all. I mean, it is it's kind of beyond parody. It's wild. Yeah, it is. I don't, you know, a really good example is um, uh, Glenn Beck, hmm. an interesting figure who's had a, had a, quite a big influence on me because um, I used to watch a show and stuff. But that was before I was really radical. When I was like a kid getting into politics. He felt somewhat libertarian in some ways, wasn't really beholden to either party, felt more sane than other news cable hosts. Although that's not a high bar. <laughs> Needless to say, over the years, obviously, um, that dude is... Uh, a little toxic on the discourse, to say the least. Um, and, you know, even when he had that moment of seeming epiphany where he was like, oh, Trump's terrible. I'm sorry for everything I've done, blah, blah. But then, you know, last I see of him, he's promoting, you know, same kind of insane anti Semitic conspiracy theories he has been about funding mass migration or riots or whatever social disruption and unrest. It's, it's just a ring how everyone, even ones like him who, seem so fervently opposed at first mm-hmm. have uh, just fallen for it um it is it really is cultish in a way that puts to shame the the cultishness of prior presidents in recent memory you know i mean pretty much every president i think when they're in office enjoys some level of kind of cultish admiration and reverence um just by virtue of the office you see that now with people like even like liberals like praying for mm-hmm. him to get better um, at all costs or whatever. It's kind of a whole other <laughs> discussion. But but yeah, it's just like this kind of cultishness inherent to the office. But he is he is elevated to a frightening level, and uh, I can't think of any. I can't really think of much better for American politics for him to just go away. I mean, however you want to interpret that. Right, right. It's um, it's very eerie how people so quickly adopted conspiracy theories. I mean, that's a normal thing now. Yeah. And if you have any conservative family, you've probably seen that yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's very disappointing. But how do we convince our conservative family that Trump isn't worth supporting? Yeah. Um, Sure. Certainly, you know, people who want whatever American prosperity or whatever should not support fucking trade protectionism and immigration bans. That's like insane from and to think that america would be better off from those things is completely baseless it's just it's just i don't know i mean maybe i sound a little pessimistic <laughs> or something but it just all seems kind of like hopeless ideological fluff mm-hmm. the everything matters only insofar as it like symbolizes some other thing right. or symbolizes value it doesn't even matter what connection it has to the real world anymore right um, so oh scary words but i think you're right <laughs> uh, I, I mean it's hard to argue with it so um, on the other side of the aisle, what's wrong with Biden and Harris? Oh, I mean, they're running for president. 
<laughs> no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like you said at the beginning, I don't really pay too much attention to electoral politics. But, you know, it seems to me that they try. It seems to me Trump has, like, moved the Overton window a little bit, at least. And whatever president we're going to get now is going to be, like, worse than the pre-Trump status quo. So, like, even if Biden wins, I think Biden will be worse than Obama was and, and Bush. Well, Bush is tough because he started the Iraq war and that, like, I mean, Trump hasn't even done anything that reaches that level of, of a single decision that, that initiated an insane sequence of events um, for suffering and, and dislocation and death for millions of people around the world. It's hard to even conceptualize the consequences of Bush uh, invading Iraq. But in, but in general, I just think that Trump has kind of shifted things and American politics is going to be a lot more protectionist and xenophobic for a while. And whether it's a Democrat in office or Republican, um, just that as usual, the Democrats are probably like a couple percent less evil. So, so what can we realistically do then, um, leading up to the election? I mean, you've you've already promoted sharing ideas and stuff like that to uh, to expand freedom. But is there any projects you can think of or specific types of actions you think folks should be engaging with um, instead of pouring all of their time, money, and energy into the electoral process? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have, I guess, some ways pet projects that um, I like and appeal to me. I hesitate to almost play central planner for trying to achieve a free world and trying to... Um, map out uh, exactly how everyone can kind of create uh, new institutions um, sort of has to be this kind of open-ended abstract goal, I think. Personally, I see a lot of value in organizations that directly aid victims of the state and states of violence. I've done stuff before with an organization called Border Angels out in San Diego, who you know, viewer, listeners might have heard of them, but uh, look them up. They, they go out in the desert along the trails that migrants use to get into the country and all year round, but especially during the summer, the heat obviously is unbearable. And because these are not routes designed for people to use to migrate, a lot of people sadly die and suffer injuries on their way. And so Border Angels is a group of people that go out and leave jugs of water and resources for migrants to pick up on these trails and have access to and help them survive along. There are probably fewer inspirational orgs I can think of. Um, I think basic stuff like that is, I mean, I don't know, like, I don't really see how phone banking for the Democrat is going to do good for the world, uh, do as much good as leaving water for an immigrant who might die without it uh, in the desert. So I just think stuff like that, I mean, that's a pretty random but specific example. It's just one organization that I've I hosted the founder, Enrique Morone, for a talk once. And and it's just, just a damn inspirational man and a damn inspirational organization. Mm-hmm. Um, I, think, I think stuff like that, direct aid to immigrants, whether it's water for them in the desert or legal aid, legal defense um, as well, is very helpful, especially now. And and And... All sorts of things. I mean, unfortunately, there's no shortage of people who are kind of victimized by the state. You know, sex workers. I've done some work with getting sex workers, um, uh, hosting them to speak and talk about their struggles and their projects and their work. Organizations that defend sex worker rights and give voice to sex workers. Um, those those are also, I think, important and, and important to me. Stuff like that, I think, is is really where it's at. Ultimately, people have their own interests and their own talents and comparative advantages, and you're the best judge of what you can do to help and how much you can help given your own life situation, you know, so it's going to depend on the individual as usual. Okay, yeah. Okay, so towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? One minute or less. Okay. Um, that's whew, it's like a challenge, man. All right. Well, then sign me up. Batman or Superman? Um, well, Batman. I prefer Batman. But Batman and Superman are both probably my favorite fictional characters. Uh, I think they almost kind of represent two sides of the human condition, like two sides of a spectrum. Um, you know, one is aspirational. One is I don't want to be fucking tortured and fucked up like that guy. And... Uh, I think there's a reason they're so resonant and, and, and long standing and continue to be reinterpreted for new cultures and new times. 
I've read I've read comics and watched movies of them since I was very little, so I really quite enjoy those characters. Um, but I find Batman generally more interesting. Rand Paul. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, blah. <laughs> no, nothing. Just just emotive response. Blah. <laughs> All right. Uh, another comparison: Seinfeld or Curb Your Enthusiasm. So I like Seinfeld. Seinfeld is definitely my favorite sitcom. I like Curb. Um, I, I like Curb. It just has a little different of a feel. It's not as consistently funny to me. But Curb, Curb is also good. But I don't think you can really beat Seinfeld. I think um, Seinfeld is really consistently funny. And um, even as it changed over the years, uh, it changed kind of style with different writers and showrunners. But, um, but yeah, big fan of Seinfeld. That, that show always makes me laugh. So. <sighs> hurts my feelings to hear you choose that but <laughs> I'll, I'll let you have it i'm so sorry it's okay ayn rand ayn rand ayn rand is overrated by people who like ayn rand and underrated by people who don't like ayn rand and she is one of the most inspirational writers of freedom um, and flourishing that i've ever read and also one of the writers who said some of the stupidest shit i've ever read like about like gender and the nuclear bomb and the Middle East, like, just completely uh, stupid. But some good stuff there, in my opinion. All right, two more. Second to last, the Libertarian Party. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're a net good. They're maybe they're a net good. I mean, they get nominally the libertarian ideas more attention, so that's that's probably good, right? They're better than conservative and liberal ideas by far. So, but libertarians would probably be better without a party. I don't know. It's almost ironic wanting to use the government to make the world more libertarian okay last one camus camus another uh favorite writer of mine um who really i think speaks to the human condition and and freedom or lack thereof and i liked it it's, it's funny you brought up camus just after just a few bit after rand i think there's this poetic symbiosis to them i like reading camus when i'm a little down and i like reading rand when i'm a little up um, I think there's a poetic symmetry to their careers because they're both known for both of their central, most remembered four works are Greek myths, Sisyphus and Alice. And um, not only that, the imagery of Sisyphus and Alice are themselves kind of poetic mirrors with Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill and Alice lifting a boulder, you know, the world above his head entirely. I don't think their philosophies are like completely reconcilable or anything. But I think there's a lot of value to be gleaned from 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 them um, as writers and, and philosophers. All right. So before we um, go to the last part of the interview, there's one more section for Patreon and listener questions. Oh, cool. And okay. yeah, so the first listener question is going to be, uh, what's the strongest argument against open borders and how do you respond to it? Conversely, what's the strongest argument for open borders? Best argument against open borders. Um, I don't know. That's a tough one. I'm pretty just ideological about open borders. I really, I am kind of like rigidly in support of open borders. Um, I guess Tyler Cowen makes the argument essentially that like in the long run, we'll get more immigration if we are just, you know, kind of gradual about it and we don't like open it all right away. Um, so in that sense, there's like a consequentialist case that like, you know, we can help more immigrants in the long run by pursuing a more moderate path now. So I guess that is what I would say. I don't even know if that's an argument against open borders because it's basically taking the values of the open borders proponent and just saying that they're achieved better via some other gradually. Means. Yeah, gradually. Specifically. Okay. So, but that's the best I got. And the best argument for open borders, there's lots of really good arguments for open borders out there. Uh, there's no shortage of them. <laughs> I think like one of the most basic insights that into morality itself, not just politics, not just the political world, but morality is that, you know, nationalism is this, is this irredeemable, is going to be this irredeemable hierarchy uh, uh, that you're not going to be able to square it with uh, universalism and, and equal liberty for every person, no matter what. So, you know, people born on this side of the line, that side of the line, people with government paperwork or without government paperwork. Like, none of it matters. Everyone has the same rights, the same moral status. I think it's that simple. Okay. 
Uh, second listener question is, what's wrong with neo-reaction, and what do you think about right libertarians cozying up to them? Um, obviously, I'm I'm anti, if that's what you're—I'm anti-right libertarians. Cos- I'm anti-anyone cozying up with fascist or fashion-adjacent ideologies. I don't know. I think all that stuff's pretty irredeemable. I think it's tragic and crazy that anyone, even remotely close to the— word or idea libertarian could find themselves close and cozying up with reactionaries uh you know i view these as really opposite ends of the spectrum it's a frustrating instance of people letting their ideas evolve for the worse um, going from some sort of plumb line libertarianism or even a kind of conservatarianism you know which i don't really like but it's better than a lot of the stuff we're seeing um sadly and a question that is almost always asked on the uh, listener portion is, how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? Any way you want. That is permitted by the natural laws of the universe, I guess. Because there will be no political laws in my utopia, obviously. So you can, I don't know, grow your own beans and make your own cappuccino. You can go trade someone some Yu-Gi-Oh cards for a cappuccino. <laughs> you can, uh, I don't know. I guess you can't steal a cappuccino if someone rightfully owns it. But if in my imagined political utopia someone had acquired a cappuccino through unjust and illegitimate means, you could you could take it from them without giving them anything in return. So those are probably the three main ways that people would get cappuccino in my utopia. Okay, so moving towards the actual end of our conversation here. Where should folks go to learn more about your politics and the political philosophy you're interested in more broadly? Um, Well, people can follow me on Twitter, I guess. It's just my name, Corey Massimino. I talk about politics on there, as well as other things like superheroes, which we've only briefly touched on here, and movies, which we didn't really touch on. Other than that, I guess you can Google my name because I have articles like kind of, you know, in disparate places, so it's not really... As of yet, I kind of want to do this in the near future, but um, there isn't really a single location to find all my interviews and articles and stuff. So, But if you Google my name, there's only one of me. There's no other Corey Massaminos, so all that will come up is stuff I wrote. And if you want to find out more about my politics in general, um, you know, C4S is, is the closest thing for sure. Um, you know, what seems to me, uh, you know, the best version of anarchism that's that's kind of been developed, so... Center for Stale Society is on Twitter and Facebook, and c4ss.org is our website. You can read our articles, op-eds. We have book reviews, studies. We also have podcasts uh, monthly, every other month, kind of. some. So all that stuff, uh, you know, check it out if you like what you've heard here. Or if you don't like what you've heard here and you want to check it out anyway, I guess you can do that too. <laughs> and uh, where, where should folks go to support you in your work? I keep wanting to make a Patreon or something, but I haven't. I don't know if if someone out there really felt the desire to support me and my work in some substantial way, then just I don't know, give money to that Border Angels organization I mentioned or something, or but maybe buy something from the C Four S store. I don't know, one of those like, two things, I guess. All right, Corey Massimino, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate that you took the time to to sit down with me, have this conversation. It wasn't the the easiest thing with our both of our busy busy schedules, and you know, thanks for being patient with me with the, through that process. And I and I appreciate you um, just sharing your thoughts today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for doing your show and. Good luck uh, as you go forward and with your next guests. And thanks for people listening. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Square. Hey, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed my conversation with Corey Masumino. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find more interviews like this one at youtube.com slash nonserviamedia. Be sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you'd like to support Nonservian Media, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviamedia. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us keep this project going. And if you can't help out financially, be sure to like and share this episode. Thank y'all so much for the support, and thank you so much for tuning in. 
We'll talk to you soon.